check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Duran, Max, Max Duran, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association Podcast. My name is Max Ron, and as always, I'm looking for the coolest stories I can find from across Canada and around the world. Today, I have Patty Robinson coming to me from the Hamilton area, actually Burlington to be exact, uh, who has done her apprenticeship under shipbuilding as a welder in the Southern Ontario region. Patty, how are you doing? I'm doing fabulous, Max. How are you today? I'm doing great. This is my final podcast of the day. It's been a Monday, uh, lots of work, busy, but it's great. I'm oh. having lots of fun. We did lots of giggling and <laughs> laughing before we even started, so this is good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Definitely broke the ice there. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm happy this is the last one. Hopefully this is like a very easygoing, relaxing podcast for you then. It's busy today. Well, it's going to be fantastic because you already gave me some gossip before we started that I loved. And- Yo, I appreciate the getting the tea at any time. Max is always ready for tea time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots of tea. So. <laughs> so, Patricia, you know, you are a female welder in the shipbuilding industry. We've had a few guests like that on the show, but it's fi- I always find it very interesting to figure out how people ended up in the shipbuilding circuit. It's kind of a niche but it's huge industry. It's a huge industry. So let's start with how you got into welding, Patricia. Like, where are you, where do you call home? Like, where's the roots of you? Like, where was baby Patricia born? Okay. So baby Patricia was born in a very small town um, in like near Barrie, Ontario. Um, I spent my childhood there. I'm the youngest of three daughters. I spent my childhood there until I was about 10. And then my parents split up. And I don't, I, I mean, I don't know the reasoning, but we somehow all moved ourselves to Burlington, Ontario. So I've been in Burlington, sometimes Hamilton, Burlington, back and forth ever since then. Um, so started with that and then went to middle school in Burlington and uh, high school in Burlington. So that's kind of where that started. So, so you've been there um, ever since. Now, in high school, what was your dream? What was it that you had planned you wanted to do for a career so it's very funny I never was someone who was ever really good at anything um I always had peers and friends that had like almost like they knew since they were little or at least knew since they were 14 of like something that they were passionate about that they loved doing whether it was like a hobby or a sport or a certain um course that they liked, whether it was math or science or biology, I was like a wet blanket. I just, I felt like I didn't love anything. I didn't hate anything. I was just kind of just going through the motions of life and just trying to get through high school. So for me, what I saw was my dad and he was kind of what I looked up to and he was a businessman. So I just thought, you know, suit and tie, like Mm -hmm. suit and tie, even if it was being a secretary for the rest of my life. I saw that as like success, like him leaving with a a briefcase every morning. Like that's what I saw. So, but I mean, I didn't have the smarts to go to business school or anything like that. So um, it's actually, I, when I think about it, I feel so silly, but um, I was the first one of the girls in my family or not girls, but just kids in my family in general to have, the marks to go to university so that was my only goal was like get into university golden child we're good everyone's happy mm-hmm. everyone's satisfied because <laughs> that was always my thing and it still kind of is is just be making everyone around me proud so um i applied to university um and how i ch- chose what program to to do was um in my grade 11 i just said whatever mark i get the best in is what I'm going to do. That's the that's the program I'm going to go into if I want to apply to university. And that was sociology. 
Okay. Could, could I explain to you even what sociology is anymore? Nope. No idea. <laughs> the study of societal like trends in order to create some forecasting that we can use in a metric and data system so that we can create programming in order to sustain systemic changes of societal program. Thank you. Was that off your brain or like, did you just Google mm-hmm. that? No, it's just, that's Wait, me. which one? Brain or Google? Oh, that's just you. Brain. <laughs> okay. Okay, brain. See, that's funny. Because like, I went into like $12,000 in debt to not know any of that. Um, so... <laughs> 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 um but anyway i got into a couple universities woo woo, and so uh i went to university and the first year was really tough it was the first time i lived away from home i think i was already struggling um i struggled with my parents divorce from day one mm-hmm. till probably even still now like therapy is probably still much needed it's like it's just it's been a long road with that um and just like the seeking of approval uh, so when I went there, it was almost like when I got accepted and then they helped me move in and then I, I was there, then it was like, okay, now what? Oh dang. It's real. Yeah. Like I've hit, hit the, that was my mountaintop. That was it. Like I did, I didn't even foresee anything else past that. I never looked at like what jobs I could get with a sociology degree, what I could be with that degree, whatever. All I thought was, is like, I will make my parents so happy if I can get into university, like I want to be the one that gets. So once I got there, it was like, okay, this is overwhelming. So I have classes, textbook work, which I've never been good at. Hence, now I'm in trades. Reading work, not good at. It was all so overwhelming. And I live in residence, or I, I lived in residence, and the party scene was insane. So I went there for one year, and I spent that entire year barely making classes, partying way too much and not being able to handle absolutely anything. So after year one, I dropped out and I retreated home with my tail between my legs. So you, the societal pressure to go to university is, 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 is across the world. It's, it's uh, it's this ideal that we created that if you can get yourself, and this is really what it is. If you can get a cushy easy job where you don't have to work very hard and get paid lots of money you made it what they forget to tell you is that all those jobs Mm -hmm. are taken by rich old white people that will never let you have them so good luck with that (laughs) right so (laughs) so so you and i went to university too and ended up being a welder so i i I hear you i i know this i get the story and on mm-hmm. another angle, I got divorced from my first wife when my daughter was nine. So I've seen how that affects kids. And and in the big picture, I had an easy divorce. You know, we mutually didn't like each other equally. So it was pretty easy. Um, but still, there's no way to get around that and, and the effect it has on your kids at that stage in life. So I'm going to try to recap and see if I'm following. Parents are from a professional background. Okay. You're, used to, you're seeing this as um, that's the standard of living that everyone should reach for is to get that kind of business acumen. You you work enough to get into university, get to university taking a, to take sociology, which is a tough degree to match to work if you don't know what you're doing because it can be a very useful yeah. degree if you want, if you have a, like a long game plan of where it fits in. But if you're just taking it for, you know, and giggles, it's not it's not a good plan. It's tough. And you realize that, honestly, you don't dig it, but you do dig partying and you don't like going to school very much. And now you're back home. Mom and dad are like, what happened? Right. Why didn't you do as good as you thought? This is now the time for you. Like you said, tail between your legs. You need to reassess. You got to tell yourself some hard truths, and you're going to have to tell your parents some hard truths. What's going on? So, the hard truths were hard. 
but I feel like at this point I was just with my mom. So th- at that point, my mom kind of had no choice but to take me back in because I had already dropped out. The paperwork was signed. Like it's, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I'm retreating home, but I'm retreating home like half the person I was before I went there. I felt like I had failed so miserably. It mm-hmm. like it broke my heart. And I know that I had let every because like I said, like the approval of everyone else is so important to me that I feel like I let so many people down. So I came home and I sat stagnant for far too long. I worked just like retail jobs at the mall, was ne- never happy, never fulfilled. There was no goal at the end of it. Like I was only working jobs to get a paycheck so that I could do things with my life and pay my rent when I was living with my mom. Um, and so for the longest time, like for the majority of my twenties, like I didn't really see like a light at the end of the tunnel. I genuinely was just waking up and surviving and that's it. So that's what I did for a very long time. Uh, Um, and then I started working, um, at the hospital. I got an admin job at the hospital, at a hospital in there, like right where I live. And, uh, um, I started working there and that was great. And then they wanted me to move up. So I took like a medical administration, uh, like course to be able to move up there. And I was moving up and I was moving up and I was making really good money, but I was miserable. (laughs) I was, I hated Mm -hmm. it, but but I felt good in a sense because, and I'm not trying to say that these other jobs are dumb jobs, like, but in my head, because of my dad being a businessman, and I feel like it was grilled into my head that like there's this job and there's like lesser jobs and lesser jobs and, and lesser jobs. And to be honest, blue collar jobs were like on the bottom of that list. I was raised mm-hmm. to believe that. That was kind of that like almost like seventies, eighties mentality. Is like the brief in the suitcase is like the good guys. And like if you're working a blue collar job, you probably have a drug problem. Or, you know, you came up from a bad family or your family's probably on welfare. Like, that was kind of, like, the mindset of that time. And I think my dad carried that throughout his life as well. Mm -hmm. So, to me, it was, like, I was just so tired. So, I thought I was making it at that point because I was working at the hospital, you know, like, working that kind of job. This is a business. There's, yeah, people dress well here and and go to school and you're working around people with degrees and stuff. Yes. And it's medical. Uh, You know, I'm working around doctors and I'm, you know, I'm assessing people kind of sort of and like writing documentation. Like, how crazy is that? Like, I felt blessed, but so uninspired. I hated I worked a lot of Mm. night shifts and uh, I didn't like any of the people that I work with. They were very, very toxic. Um, Those work environments are very much um, seniority. So most of the time, the people that you're working with have been doing it for 40 years and they're are like, they're so bitter because <laughs> it's a hard job. I'm not even trying mm-hmm. to say that it's silly or easy. It's a very hard job. So people that have been doing it for that long, you reach a cap, like probably at five years. And these people have been there for like 30 years. It was just a very toxic environment. And so my, ma- my, my mindset was, um, and I think once again, this is like learned by like my father and like my peers was like, well, no one likes their job. Like, no, yeah, just no one does. Yeah. No, no one likes it. But like, you know what people have is hobbies. People have hobbies outside of work to kind of like that life. Like no one really enjoys going to work. All I see are people talking about how much they hate having to get up and go to work. So like, I'm not alone here, but they have hobbies that kind of fulfill certain needs. And so... Um, and on a whim, I just signed up for for a women in woodworking course that was being held near where I live. Sorry, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I thought, well, that's fine because it's all women. So like, I don't have to feel really stupid because like I said, my dad was in business and my mom was a stay at home mom and I'm a family of all sisters. So I never even like seen a drill at that point or like held a power tool or i didn't even know what a, <laughs> i there you know like there's like certain like muscle memories of even just like seeing someone do something like no like i have no history <laughs> with any of this yeah yeah but i thought it would be so cool to know how to build something so i took this course and it 
that was the moment for me. I don't think I realized it was the moment, but it was using the big machinery, like the planer. And I got to build a whole bunch of cool stuff and being able to use the power tools that I just thought like, this is really neat. And I thought, well, this is like a fun hobby. I could just do this while I do like the big thing. Cause in my head, the medical administration was like, whoa, like how impressive, like big paychecks, like how, how nice. And then um, after I finished that, that's when COVID hit really, really hard, really mm. hard. And they let go a big chunk of us newbies that had just gotten gotten there in the last six months. And I was like, what am I going to do now? And the course, the next, because they had like a level one and a level two, the level two course was so expensive. And with me being laid off, I couldn't really afford to take it. So I was like, well, what am I going to do with my time? And then I was randomly, like, just scrambling on Instagram, like I always am. And there was an ad for the same school that I went to for that, for a free government-funded, um, uh, like, construction-based pre-apprenticeship. And I was like, okay. I did not think. I just, like, put my name in and my email. And I was like, they'll call you for, like, an interview if, you're, if they're interested. And I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, and while all the while applying for other like admin jobs, hoping I could get somewhere. But at that point with COVID being so like, there was no way. Yeah. Nothing's moving. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So um, I uh, got a call back and I did an interview and I got it. And it was, um, I think it was, it, it, this was like two years ago. So it feels like it's forever ago. I think it was like, 20 weeks 16 or 20 weeks mm-hmm. um and it was just basic framing a blueprint reading a concrete forming that kind of stuff but I got in it and as soon as I started I loved it like I got mm-hmm. up every day to pay money to go to that class every day and like I said I wasn't getting paid for I went on EI obviously um but and I was so passionate about it. And I was so excited to be there. And everything I was learning was making me so happy. And I knew, especially then, that I was like, I can honestly say that when I graduate from this, I will never sit behind a cubicle for the rest of my life. Because <laughs> I had done it for so long. And I was like, I, there's no way. There's no way I will ever go back. And I loved it. And it was so great. Our class consisted of like a handful of like, older gentlemen a couple really really young guys like as young as 18 19 that had just finished their oh yeah and then a couple girls and I was the, one of the only girls that graduated but that was an incredible experience like the teachers were so patient I learned so much um and then I was extra lucky because we had they like, almost had like a like one day a week was like a like a mentorship kind of a situation we went into a classroom and they would talk about like your soft skills your hard skills like how to write a resume all that kind of stuff and we had speakers sometimes and we had a speaker from local 27 which is the toronto um carpenters union and he came in and he spoke and uh i was sold (laughs) and so (laughs) i yeah (laughs) And so I was recruited in that class to join as soon as I had graduated. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I'm doing so much speaking and you're just, I'm sorry. No, this is great. I'm loving this. <laughs> this is perfect. So, you know, uh, during you this process, thus far? Yes. <laughs> Oh, I got lots. I got lots. I, I'm just waiting for a, for a break and it's good because this sorry, is exactly sorry. what so many people go through. So many people like, you have no idea how many thousands and thousands of young people across this country or even people that are looking to transition out of a job that they hate sitting behind a desk or being at some, you know, admin job where they've been there for 10 years and haven't gotten a raise in 10 years. And, and there's all this seniority and unions and they're stuck and they don't know what to do. And, and they have all this pressure coming on them from somewhere it could be parents it could be society it could be expectations it could be whatever to stay in that job because it's better than the alternative 
even when you don't even know what the alternative is. You don't even know what the alternative is, but somehow this is better than that, right? Now, for yourself, what was the biggest thing that was going in the back of your mind in terms of liking the trades? You're you're trying carpentry. You're starting to like this. You're kind of falling in love, right? It's like it's like you, it's like it's like you had a Tinder date with carpentry, and you actually dig it. Like you're digging it, but you know that everyone on or you feel maybe not know, but you feel like everyone in your life is going to be like, what are you doing? This is terrible. This is a bad idea. How did you feel about that? Um, I think luckily I get close loved ones. And I think that no one didn't notice that I was lost, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think it was almost like, and I and it wasn't even like um you know when someone is really lost and they like pick up like a passion every like two months and they like and then they drop it and then pick something else up. Yeah. I wasn't even doing that. Yeah. I was just a zombie, a complete and utter zombie. Especially You didn't pick up bead making and horseshoe <laughs> farriers and glass cutting and No. Oh, I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> I considered panel making. That's a business. I considered it. <laughs> But that's so making a lot to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> I didn't have the money mm-hmm. for that. So I dropped that really quick. Um I think I I just what it was was the that first course that I took. Uh in that moment when I, I was happy when I was there, it that didn't sink in yet. Like that's only a retrospective moment. Um mm-hmm. I genuinely was just happy being there and I looked it was twice a week and I looked forward to that night always like that was Mm, like more than the whole rest of the week yeah always like it's almost like how you look forward to the weekend I'm like only only two Mm -hmm. more days till class like only and so I loved it so much and it never hit I just thought like oh look I found something that I enjoy um I think it was I was heartbroken from the layoff because, like I said, I thought that that was my mountain now. I am mm-hmm. a medical administrative person for a big hospital. Um, and with hospital jobs, it's like union jobs. Like, you, once you're in, you're, you're in. Like, you're, yeah. it's, you're good. And that's how I saw it. it. was like, this is my peak success. But I was miserable. So then once I was laid off, it was like, oh, my God, who am I? what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Like, who am I even as a person? And I've always been interested in doing trades, even just from like, I don't have, like I said, like my family wasn't in trades, but having significant others, which I think is also a testament. I've only ever had romantic relationships with men in trades. So even like living, (laughs) so there was something there, there was something there. Yes, When they come home, like covered in filth, like, dirty, exhausted, and they tell me the coolest stories about, like, what they did that day, and I'm like, oh, I uh, sent some emails and someone died yesterday. That's about it. And I'm not trying to, like, disregard that job. That job is so hard. It is so, so difficult. But if it's your niche, it's your niche. Like, every... Yes. Yeah, I exactly. I grew up in a communist ho- communist household, which is that throws people off sometimes. But in yeah. communism... Um, no job is bigger than any other job. That's one of the principal rules of yeah. communal society is that everyone is equally important. The doctor, the garbage man, the taxi driver, the librarian. Every single job is crucial for society to roll yeah. well. It's about whether you like your gig or not. Exactly. And that's why I find it hard to talk about like my story because I feel like sometimes I'm afraid to come off like I'm better than the office worker or I'm better than and it's like, no, it just wasn't for me. Like, it just made mm-hmm. me miserable. There's people that are just, like happy as all <laughs> spend their whole life there and they enjoy it. And like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to answer phones and be behind a, a cubicle because honestly, even when I because before I did office work, I did customer service. And um, when COVID first started, that's what I was doing. And just being one of the few people in the office and being able to help people when they needed it. Like, I, that felt, felt like super fulfilling. Like, there's nothing that's not fulfilling about 
all these other things that you could do. So I also want to mention that because I sometimes feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not be like, oh, I did like this like terrible job. No, and, and people leave the trades too. Like, people, no, <laughs> not even you know, I worked as a teacher for a long time and I saw lots of people enter the trades and a couple of years into the trades, they were like, this is not for me. Right. Yeah. So it goes, it goes both ways. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, and to be honest, I've tried to leave the trades a couple of times. There was a couple of times in my life where as a welder, I was crying on the way to work and I hated my job and I didn't know what I was going to do with myself and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, and it comes around, but for you with your journey, you know, having, I love how you have that mental image of your dad in a suit and a briefcase going to work as that, that that's being success. And in today's world, I don't think that anyone sees that as success anymore. I think that that's been played out. You know what I mean? I think like I'm, I'm almost 32. I think that like my, like I, I graduated high school in 2010. At that time, this is why we're having issues. At that time, it mm-hmm. wasn't just like, oh, women can't be in trades. I remember <clears throat> being pushed into tech because tech was just like blowing the <laughs> up. Like, yeah, you know, like, So, like, that was the big push. So, even the men that I graduated with, it was tech, tech, tech. I don't think I remember ever coming across anyone in high school that that was, like, dedicated to shop class. Like, like, and there wasn't even really options for that. Or if they were, they were getting pushed out of it. Yeah. Yes. Or if they were, then they were, like, the dirty, like, trailer park sorry trailer park kid that like we just like didn't just dis- like that we disregarded because i think like, there was still that mindset where it's like the dirty uneducated people are the ones that end up in trades which is like not even remotely the case like you got to be sharp as an axe if you want to progress mm-hmm. in trade 100 mm-hmm. percent um so it's funny how it's changed now and i in I, i'm like happy it's changed but i'm also annoyed that it's changed now but now it's like I see ads constantly about like wanting people in <laughs> trades. I'm like, well, well, yeah, because now everyone is retiring and there's no one, there's no predecessors to take over their place. And now everyone is scrambling and work's not getting done. Like I live in Burlington, so there's not much, but like in just in Hamilton, there's just cranes that have been up for years. that are not being used. Like just like there's, there's buildings that have been waiting to build. Half probably done, homeowners yeah. That are waiting. <laughs> yep. Like work is not getting done because there's not enough people and there's not enough money. Like it's just, it's, it's crazy. So you're, you're in your, you, you bite into the carpentry cookie. The guy comes and gives yeah. you the union hall talk. You sign up to, to the local, I think 25, <laughs> you said, and, and then what happened? You're in welding now. <laughs> yeah. So um, when did the switch go- happen there? It didn't go the way that I thought it would. So I signed up for the union. Um, what I realized really quickly is they were like very much mass signing people up to the union, probably for the mm. same reason we were just talking about mm-hmm. mass signing, just mass. I walked in there and I just wanted to know a little bit more information. And then it was like, okay, just go into this room. And it was like a full room of like probably 30 people that were signing documents. And it was a big presentation about like, okay, you've joined the union now. And I was just so excited that they would even think to sign me. Because that's also a trait that I have is I just think that I'm too stupid. Like, or like no one would want me. So like, I was just like, really? Like, I was just here to ask some questions. And you want me to like, sign you know, I'm part of the union. Oh my God, that's amazing. So, um, so I did that. And it was just kind of like, in the span of like five hours, all of a sudden, I was a part of the union and then I was just waiting for a job. Um, So I was a part of the union for about a year. I had one job that lasted about three months. The rest of the time I was just waiting for a call. Oh man. That's not very encouraging. It's not. And you know what? Like I'm not trying to say that unions are bad. Like it just depends on what you need and what you want. It also depends on like on who, you know, in your area, a hundred percent. It's your area. Mine's Toronto, the biggest area ever. Uh, So not ever, but you know what I mean? Like it's super Mm -hmm, large. mm -hmm. So they probably have people applying and 
that are way more that have way more experience or have more than me on a constant basis. So I was very much like bottom the of the list. You're at the bottom of the list. The yeah, biggest yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, just on the fact that I needed to pay my rent and to pay bills um, after being about like, I think it was about eight or nine months on the wait list. Mm-hmm. I applied to a shipyard in Hamilton, just as a general labor. So that's how that started. Okay. All right. But I, I got a question. I got a question, okay. if I may. Yes. Why or where did your lack of self-esteem come from? Because one of the things that welders learn to cultivate early on in welding is a sense of confidence because our trade is hard and there's testing that happens like on the daily, you have people looking over your shoulder constantly. So if yeah. you don't have even a little bit of confidence in welding, you buckle because there's no other trade that is so diligent in testing your butt, you know, which weeds out a lot of people. But from your high school, you said in high school, you weren't very good. You were a wet blanket. You said that you had this idea of success. You've used the word failure like three different times you know, discussing your adolescence and your young life. So there's a very constant theme here of Patty thinking that she doesn't deserve to do better or this is as high as she gets, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Where? How? This is the therapy side now. You know, know. like, because... I know, you're making me tearful a little bit, which is okay. This is what this is for. I don't but know. this is, you know, and this, and you know, I'm, I'm saying this because people like you are in the same situation. Uh-huh. I taught in the college for eight years. I saw so much of this of being like, you know, w- w- you're putting barriers up in front of yourself, you know, and, and do you feel like that came from family? Do you feel like it came from just your own experience with school? Because some people have terrible experiences with elementary school, you know, like, um, and and you're just the carpentry class was like the first time you started to feel confident ever. That's what that feeling was when you're like, I want to go there. Well, you know why you want to go there? Because it's a dopamine rush. You feel good. You yeah. feel happy. Mm-hmm. That's huge. And you hadn't really ever gotten that before. Yeah. And like, that's why I'm so thankful um, that I actually like did enough work. Like, I think my my pre-apprenticeship is what changed me in so many ways. Because if you had asked me, like, two years prior, when I got into the union and I wasn't getting work, old me would have just, like, depleted and would have gone back to an office job. I would have said, this is not for me. I've been waiting. I put myself out there. I went to an apprenticeship, a pre-apprenticeship. I finished it with honors. I did a speech. Like I did, I did, I've done everything. So like, what else am I supposed to like? Okay. So I'll just go back. But no, it was like that thing, like that spark that I loved it so much that I was like, no, I have to keep going. I have to keep going. I like working with my hands. I like that. Where did it come from? Max thought I could not tell you. <laughs> I could not tell you. <laughs> um, I think, I think probably my parents. Yeah. Yeah. The divorce? I think so. And I very much flip flop between mm-hmm. my parents. It was very much like passed back and forth to whenever it was convenient. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, and I get I that. I struggled. Yeah. Families get that. We I saw that yeah. with my kids as they went back and forth between me and their mom and different expectations and different houses, different rules. Plus, you got school and, and your friends, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't even mean, like, flip-flop is in, the, like, oh, like, weekends and day, like, weekdays. It was kind of like, mm-hmm. I got this going on, so I don't want that anymore. So you take her for a while. And then, like, back mm-hmm. and forth, like that. So. Right. If I think about it, that's probably what it is. So just wanting to be good enough. Right. Yeah. No, and that's validation is both the hardest part and the best part of the trades. Yeah. Because the trades are not about how you look, not about how you feel at home. The trades are not about what's going on 
The trades are about what do you got in front of you? How you show up and how hard you work. And I think that's why now, like, I'm finding so much success is because, like, it's just about me. And, like, that's it. And, like, me showing Mm -hmm. up and, like, me doing my best. And, like, there's no deeper value to that. It's just, and find something that I love, like, something that I'm actually passionate about. Um, It's become, like, my life and my hobby all at the same time, which I, like, some therapists would always say that's unhealthy. (laughs) Like it just it makes me so happy <laughs> that I love doing it, and like, I show up every day so excited and so happy, and like want to learn absolutely everything. And I've never felt that ever in my life, like purpose, like knowing that like mm-hmm. there's something that I want to be, and it like it's reachable and like touchable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, let's take a break now for our advertisers okay. and sponsors, and we'll be right back okay. after this commercial from our supporters to continue with the journey of Patricia Robinson, because I want to hear about shipbuilding and this new journey that you're on. So stay tuned here on the CWB Association podcast. Don't go anywhere. The CWB Association is new and improved and focused on you. We offer a free membership with lots of benefits to anyone interested in joining an association that is passionate about welding. We are committed to educating, informing, and connecting our workforce. Gain access to your free digital publication of The Weld Magazine, free online training, conferences, and lots of giveaways. Reach out to your local CWB Association chapter today to connect with other welding professionals and share welding as a trade in your community. Build your career, stay informed, and support the Canadian welding industry. Join today and learn more at cwbassociation.org. And we are back here on the CWB Association podcast. My name is Max Strawn. Thanks for staying with us on this wonderful show. We got Patty Robinson coming to us from Burlington, Ontario. Before the break, we were talking about how winding the road can be to finding something that may have been in you all along, which is this desire to create and build and learn. Finding those pathways. I preach it all the time. Uh, You know, I, I tour around the world doing talks and and talking to groups of people. It's what I do. And a lot of what I talk to people when I'm trying to be a mentor to them is just getting them to understand the pathways and, and how there is no end. There is no such thing as a finish line and there's no such thing as failure. Those are two things that just aren't a thing. Those are things (laughs) that we create for ourselves. They're not real words. Like you don't, you don't see, you know, birds or, you know, eagles or I don't know hippopotamuses being like i failed like it's not we do that to ourselves right yeah. now you 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 were uh, a little less than i wouldn't say satisfied with the carpentry job not because you didn't love it and it was fun but you just not, didn't have the work which is yeah. fair like you need to work everyone needs to make money so yeah. you decide to apply uh, for a shipyard in your area that um, is a big is a big hire of the area, and I know that they they had been looking for people for a long time. Yeah, and you just go on as a laborer. Yeah. Now that's kind of walking in, you know, kind of into the unknown, carte blanche, right? Being like, yeah. "Hey, I'm here. Basically, I'm willing to do whatever you need. Hire me." Mm-hmm. Right? How was that walking? Because shipyards are kind of scary to even just walk into, like. They are, but, like, for me, like, even just going into the interview, like, I had to go into the yard, and I saw all the huge Coast Guard ships, and I almost, like, I was, like, uh, in my head, I was, like, uh, there's not going to hire me at all. Like, I can't work here. <laughs> like, are you, like, there's no way whatsoever. And, yeah, like, the people I encountered were in, like, filthy overalls, just, like, like, just, like, like, just spitting everywhere. Everyone looked just, like, and I was, like, I love this. Can I be here? And so I went into the interview scared as because I was like, I am like, I don't like, especially, I mean, I did my carpentry and stuff like that, but I do feel like I get off, I give off, sorry, like a very girly image. And I was like, oh, I'm like, I don't think that they're going to think I'm going to fit in here. And I went to my interview and it was like a few small questions. It was like, can you lift 50 pounds? Are you okay with confined space? Are you okay with working like heights? I just blindly was like, yeah. Yes. And they're like, okay. All good. And I was yeah. like, okay. And then when I started there, it, it was like the, it was the most fun I, I've i ever had. Like if I could go back in time and re-experience something, it would be being a general labor at the shipyard. The mentors I had, there was no, 
like me being a girl was not a weird thing at all. Um, I got to work in tanks and huge ships and I was just, I was cleaning them. I was doing like dirty, dirty mm-hmm. work. And I was smiling the whole time I was coming out covered in grease, but I was like, this is so cool. Like these ships are larger than life. These ships mm-hmm. save lives. And like, we're, I'm cleaning them like that. These tanks hold the water that supply what these people are going to be drinking when they're on the ship. Like, that's crazy. Like, I, that's insane to me. Like, I definitely saw a full picture when I was there. And I just thought everything was so, so, so cool. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what propelled me from being a laborer to. As I think any opportunity to do anything, whether it was dirty, disgusting, smelly i was like okay put on my hazmat suit let's go do this like i was so excited yeah, yeah. let's get it on everything. yeah like i just thought that everything was so neat and so cool i still do i don't know why i put it in like past tense but it's just there's no job that's like too dirty or like below me it's i'm contributing to a picture and that's how i see things always like i'm contributing to a picture that's so much bigger than just what i'm doing right now and that's, that's right. A hundred percent how I felt all the time. Um, and then I kind of was trying to ache to get on the carpenters team because they have one. Um, because I was still technically an apprentice with the local that I was in because I was waiting for right. a call. But if they wanted an apprentice with the carpenters team, then like that would be my way in. So I was trying to like kind of get in with them because how the shipyard works which i love is that like pretty much unless you're fully certified how you start is you always start as a general laborer and then after three months of work they can decide where you go or or they they ask you during those three months being like is there a team that you like because they'll plop Mm -hmm. you in all different teams whether it's plumbers electricians whether it's welders uh millwrights They'll kind of slowly put you in different teams. And if you kind of fit into to a certain team, they'll express that. Or if someone wants you on their team, then you in three months, the whole the whole point of it is that after three months, you get promoted. So they're always looking for general laborers for that reason, because they get bumped mm-hmm. up every three months regardless. Um, and I was like, carpenters, 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 I want to be an apprentice. And then I learned like two and a half months in, into my uh, work there that they didn't, they didn't have a red seal. So I couldn't be an apprentice. And I was like, Oh, right. <laughs> and that there wasn't, now much, what? <laughs> and there wasn't much carpentry work at all. And I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, and like their team was full. And I was like, Oh, okay. Okay. And I was like, all right. Now what? <laughs> uh, cool. And then I remember I was on the ship. I think I was doing firewatch or something like that, or confined space. And I saw like a group of really young um, um, general laborers like that had been hired like two weeks ago that were using extending torch torches to cut scrap on the yard. And I was like, that's I cool. Because in my pre-apprenticeship, that was a weird certification that I got from like, you know, was like to be able to torch cut. And I was like, OK, well, I know how to do that. So like so then I went to my boss. I was like, I know how to do that. And he was like, OK, well, I'll mention it. And I was like. I'm a <laughs> <laughs> was that your stink eye is that the so Patricia I, stink eye <laughs> a little bit like he he very much was like i think because i was so willing to do whatever he asked me to do he was like you're not going anywhere listen here missy Moo. you're not moving. <laughs> like, i love you it's not gonna happen so then i uh went to my buddy who was doing that and i was like who is teaching you how to do this who is that and he pointed me in the direction of this one man and i was like okay, this is my moment. And I felt like in a weird way, it was a life-changing moment. And I was like, I need to go to this man that I've never talked to in my life who terrifies me. And I need to say, I know how to do this. Let me do it as well. So I went up to him and I said that to him and he just smiled at me and he was like, okay, I'll see. Let's see what you got. <laughs> so like mm-hmm. on the spot, I just started torch cutting and he was like, okay, perfect. And he was like, okay, you can start doing that. So I, I did that for a while. And then there was a big group of us. And then he pulled a aside me and another man another dude that was doing it and said hey so i've been watching the torch cutting you guys have been doing and i thought i was gonna get that. and he was like would you be interested in le- like it looks good like would you want to learn how to weld i was like 
because I know that welding is a part of carpentry eventually, especially like within the apprenticeship. So I was like, because my head was still carpentry. My head was still just fluttered mm-hmm. with 24-7. So I was like, well, I guess like it's good to know now. Like I'm still like leveling up where I'm working. So, okay. So I said yes. The second that I put that stick on that rod and sparked that arc, I was like, yeah, no. I could never do carpentry ever again. I became, I, and I have been obsessed, absolutely obsessed. And I'm not someone, especially with welding, because I have seen that it's either you start, you try it and you hate it, or you try it and you're like really, really good at it. I'm like in the middle mm-hmm. where I tried it. I really liked it, but like it took a lot of work. And that man that suggested that I wanted to learn saw something in me and took so much time to be able to mentor me to make sure that I got to a point where our steel supervisor took like a month of me in the booth practicing all the time with everyone being like, no, like give her more time, give her more time. Like it's like, she's good. Like give her more time. She's got it. Like she's got the thing. Just give her more time, which I, I'm like, that's so exciting for me. Uh, for the steel supervisor to eventually be convinced enough to come over and to look at some of the stuff that I did. And I remember I wasn't even ready. I was just in my booth and I was just doing beads. And I think there was a couple things that I had to build. So I, I built them. And uh, this, I don't know if I want to say names, but he opened the door and he was like, oh, he's here to look at your welds. And I had no idea. And I was like, oh my God. And he came in, he went, And then walked out and then he looked at me and he, he was like, you start on steel on Monday. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and I like, like, and then he just like walked away. And then Ariel looked at me. Oh, sorry. I just said his name. But he would look at me. He was like, I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I've been so, so blessed with like mentorship. 150%. So that's kind so of where you, you, you get that. You get that amazing day where they're like, okay, you're going to come over to steel side. And once yeah. you fall in love with that little blue light, it's like crack. So you got to watch out because then it's like never goes away. Like, <laughs> No one tells you that. No one told me that. <laughs> we try to not tell everybody because then like everyone would want to be welders. Right? Yeah, that's so, true. That's true. No. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all a lie. If you're listening to this, it's a lie. <laughs> But what happens to your apprenticeship now? So this is how long ago? This is now a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And you get signed up to go onto the steel side, which means you're going to be welding most of the day, if not all day. What are you thinking? Are you like, oh, man, what's like, what path am I on now? Oh, I'm fully on a welding path. At that point, um, I've just stopped paying my dues. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I had mentally checked out from that. I was so obsessed and I, I was working crazy, crazy hours. They, they needed a lot of hours. Um, and at that point, it was just getting tickets, getting tickets, getting tickets, getting tickets. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and then about like maybe two months after I had just been on steel crew. And at that point, I wasn't really welding because to, to weld on the Coast Guard ships, they're very picky. You have to be CWB certified. You yeah, have you to have be. to be. Yeah, absolutely. So before I got my tickets, I was mostly just being a helper. But even just being a part of it was so fun to me. Like even just carrying the equipment. Like I will carry your suitcase. Mm-hmm. I will carry your suitcase that's full of wire up seven staircases if I have to. Like I yeah. loved it. So did you um, do your first block of school for welding already? No. That would have been this summer, but I think I would have needed a certain amount of hours, which I hadn't just yet accumulated. Like I got, I wish I had my letter when I actually got accepted. It was because I started training for welding in like late October of last year. So this has all happened very fast. Mm -hmm. And then I started my apprenticeship like maybe in February or March. Um, I worked a lot of hours, but, but no, and now it's quick. It's recent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This is very, very recent. So, but yeah. And I like, Oh God, it's been like an incredible journey. And like, I just, I'm, it's the most fun I've ever had. Like I said, like I, I'm more of a welder helper at this point. 
Um, I know how to weld. I have my tickets for Flux Core, but it's just like, starting. Yeah, but even just being a part of it, like mm-hmm. the men that I've worked with are so smart and like they're so good at what they do. I was part of a like a Ukrainian team. Right. The most fun. Like <laughs> literally <laughs> the most fun. Like and it's hard. Like I started out and I think they were just like, what is this human? Like get like <laughs> who is yeah, like why yeah. is she on our crew? We hate this. Like who is she? And they would just speak to like each other in Ukrainian. And um then like over the span of like maybe a week and a half. It's like then we started getting really close. And then after like less than a month, we were all like family. And they were actually letting me do things, like letting me prep things. It took time. That's one thing that I would like to say to especially women out there is like be patient. There are stupid little things that some men have in their brains that they kind of think that like you can't do things. But most nice guys, like it takes such a small amount of time to work that out of there. Just be there, show up, want to do it want to do the work, offer to do the work, ask to do the work. Like for me, I'd be like, could I, could I do it? If they say no, they're like, oh, no, 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 I'll do it. Don't worry about it. I'll do it. Doesn't mean next time I'm not going to ask. They'll be like, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, like yeah, sometimes, yeah. unfortunately, you have to really prove that you want to do it. And then near the end um, of the project that we were working on, it was kind of like, I didn't even need to ask. It was like, oh, like Patty, you could do this. Like Patty, you'll do that. Or like, it was like, expected of me to do it. Like a lot of the hard mm-hmm. work that was involved. Um, and so it was really fun, such like respect for each other. And yeah. So how much changed or what changed in you that you went from being scared to saying what you felt about university, scared to admit you hated the medical job, scared to figure, you know, to make these decisions to now when, you're like, no, I want to do that. Give it to me. You know, there's a big shift there. Yeah, it's the thing. It's finding the thing. It's, and that's what I also said to my main mentor that was teaching me. Because like I said, in the beginning, I was failing, 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 failing. Just like doing okay. Like okay enough to keep training me. But in my head because there was a small group of us that were being trained, I was probably doing the worst and I was not progressing like everyone around me and the person that I am. And it's the worst trade I have where it's, I'm that I'm that jerk that if I try a card game for the first time and I'm not good at it instantly, I just say, I don't like it. And then I'll never play it again. Like <laughs> I'm the guy, you know, that guy. Like, just a sore that's loser. The, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one, yeah, that's like, you know what? It's not because I'm not, it's, I'm not bad at it. I just don't like it. Like, that's kind of like the person I am. So the fact that like that didn't even happen for a second, it almost mm-hmm. like my failure kept me hungry. Like I've said this from the beginning and I will say it till the day I die. Is that I don't want to be a good welder. I want to be, I don't want to be a great welder. I want to be the best welder. I want to be the mm-hmm. best welder. And for some reason, like that one thing, that I found sparked that in me where like giving up wasn't an option at all. Yeah. You know, I was That's coming awesome. in on my Saturdays and Sundays unpaid just to practice. Cause I, cause my goal is to be the best. I want to impress everyone around me. I want everyone to gasp at the ones that I create. And I've never felt that about anything else in my entire life, whether it's carpentry, whether it's office work, whether it's, you know, before it was just kind of like doing things to, fill my day and get me by this is get by, yeah. completely different yeah yeah well i feel like that that's the beauty and the fear of welding the beauty of welding is when you get into that cycle and it's not about you or them or whoever it's just you in that weld and like yeah. bro, like bro i'm gonna make you so nice that people <laughs> will walk by in 50 years and be like wow look at that well that's amazing yes. Because when I go did out that, into the is... world, that's the first thing I notice. I'm looking at that's right. being like, that's trash. That's beautiful. I know that's sick. That's probably big. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it's a competitiveness with yourself yeah. that that breeds that level of excellence. Like, I mean, I've I've gotten really weird about it just in my travels in life. Like I remember being in Mexico and the first time I went to a pyramid 
they're like, you, can, you, can, you can't cross that line. You can't actually touch this pyramid. It's a sacred pyramid. I totally jacked over the line and ran over there. And I just wanted to touch it because I thought about it like me as a welder. Some dude put that block there perfectly, like perfectly yeah. 10,000 years ago. And it's still in the exact same spot. They built this thing so perfect that 10,000 year, years later, it's still here. Yeah. I've, I'm connecting with that human. He's long dead. But I'm connecting with him yes. and his professionalism. Yeah. And I think about that when I build things that I'm like, wow, someone's going to connect with this somewhere way down the line, you know? Yes, absolutely. Or like, you know, like the small things that I'm doing right now are affecting so many different things or creating ease for so many different people. And they'll never think of that or think of me, but like I will. And like that's important. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you know what? That like need to please probably being fulfilled a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. Yeah. Well, and it's internal, which is where it should be. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. the most important the most important person in your life should always be you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, talking about that vibe, women on site, you know, wonderful organization. My staff is a part of it. I help. I pay for my staff. Like, I think it's great for them. Daniela, you know, it's important. Um, I love seeing stuff like this. What's your connection to women on site? Tell people what it's about. Um, Well, first of all, it's incredible. Um, So my connection is I do uh, help facilitate. So what we do in the grand scheme of women on site, if I'm going to be broad about it, it's just Mm -hmm. an organization to help women feel connected to network and to be able to express their thoughts, feelings um, in a positive environment with other women that are like them, because it's very hard. Like even in my shipyard, Mm -hmm. there's eh, probably like 200 employees. There's double women. Um, So it's kind of nice to be able to have an organization where people can come together and you're not alone in what you're feeling. Cause it does feel very lonely at times um, to understand one another about to, to understand what it feels like and not saying that there's other realms of work where it's still male dominated. I think this mm-hmm. one's just a little bit more of a niche right now. It's a little bit more of a, an issue. Um, but um, as, a, as an organization, we do big events that happen every season and then we do also monthly events so i'm a part of actually the monthly meetup chapter so uh, me and my one uh woman on site friend we host a hamilton chapter meetup where pretty much what we do is we leave it completely open to rsvp you can either say you're going to come or you don't doesn't matter it's very open it's the first wednesday of every month and we show up and then women of all different sectors of construction and STEM can show up. And we all just sit down, have a drink, eat some food and just kind of talk about our week, talk about our month, talk about whatever. Um, I find it so important because especially in Hamilton, we've had quite a few girls that have come in. Oh, they want to go into construction or STEM. They're still not sure what they want to do, but they wanted to come and just pick other people's brains like. I love that. Like, I encourage that mm-hmm. so much. You don't have to be a red seal or an apprentice. You don't have to be in a blue collar job. Even if you're just thinking about it, just come and just come chat with us because we have, even just in Hamilton, we have like welders, uh, like carpenters, millwrights, electricians, plumbers, like of all, like all different trades that are there every single week that you could like pick their brains, especially since they live in the area. You can even like mm-hmm. network about jobs who they can contact apprenticeships schooling like there's so many different things um and we have chapters now all across canada and now we have one in the u.s so we're spreading and spreading and spreading so another Mm -hmm. podcast right now but if anyone is even thinking about joining trades or if you are in trades and you're just looking for a space to network as a woman women on site So that's on Instagram and also womenonsite.ca and look it up and see if there's a chapter near you. And if you're a woman on site right now and there isn't a chapter where you're at, you can fill out a form and you can become a chapter at that point and you can get sponsored 
And then you can also host your own monthly events, which is also really cool. So we're just trying to grow and grow. We want this to be a space where there's no place where a woman feels like there's no one they can connect to woman to woman Mm -hmm. (laughs) when it comes to this stuff. And you know what? I think what we're really praying for is in like 20 years, we won't even need a woman on site group because there's going to be like equal 50, 50 men and women on every site. I think there's always going to be a space for it just in terms of just there, there's, there's equity and then there's equality, right? Yeah. Slightly different. We might have equality of representation in terms of women versus men. It might be 50-50 someday and we're going to be like, yay. But there's always going to be situations of equity. And I think those discussions sometimes are best had amongst the equity groups. You know, like if I'm, if you know, maybe someday there's no racism, right? And I mean, I've had a lot of racism issues in my life against me. Maybe yeah. someday there's no racism. But I still feel most comfortable talking about those things with people of in the, in the BIPOC community, right? It's just a equity versus equality. It's it's a tough thing, but that's true. I think that's it's true. I think it's beautiful, anyways, um, because you always want to feel comfortable. If it, or I should, how do I say it? If you're not comfortable, you're not going to say how you really feel. A hundred percent, and a lot of the stuff, like we deal with, very like light stuff. Like mm-hmm. you know, like I find that there's a lot of women in our I mean, I don't know if it's the same, but in Ontario where it's like, there's a lot of positive stuff, but if there's a negative situation, it's crazy. Like watching all of us just like, just like being like, okay, well, I've been there before and I did this and this and this, so try that. Like I've done that before. Actually, I know that employer, so I'll figure that like, it just, it's just a network where it's like, you're you're safe. And it's not Mm -hmm. like we're just listening and we go, oh, okay, that's sad. Okay, never mind. Like we all try to help each other and figure out. job and there's no one for her to talk to and she feels like this is just this is like almost like the realization of like this is how it is the rest of my life if I don't change it then they don't stay and we don't want that either so it's just giving that space to be able to be like yeah no we 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 get it (laughs) for you what's the what's the pathway now going forward what what's the next you know thing you're looking at to to achieving or accomplishing um honestly experience like i would love to say journeyman status red seal that would be that is like the on paper plan but just to continue welding i don't even care what it takes i don't care where i'm at i don't because i think that the one thing that i've learned as being a welder is that welding is different everywhere you go and to mm-hmm. being a well-rounded welder is being able to adapt. Like, that's what I've learned is, like, that's a good welder. Anyone could weld in a shop doing the same bead with the same humidity, the same steel, the same. I want to be able to master, be able to look at a weld, like, like figure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be that person where it's, like, it could be the <laughs> place to weld, but I could prep that area like a queen and be able to do the best weld ever so i think that for me it's just i i want to i want to try to be able to master every single like whether it comes with an apprenticeship or not just being able to Uh master because that's once again it's like a personal thing like i want to be able i want to be the best so so you want to be the weld whisperer yes i want to be the one where they're like oh (laughs) that's a terrible job how are we ever going to do that? Or like that is such a small space with so much rust and like behind a huge pipe in a small room. Who the <laughs> hell? Now go Patricia. Call Patricia, obviously. Like that's, that's yeah, what I yeah. want. Or call Patty. That's that's who I want to be, which I'm sure when that day comes, I'm going to like, be like, really? I got to go do this. <laughs> but I. <laughs> Yeah, but you're going to be charging like 150 an hour to be like, I got you. I got you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just, like, for some reason, yeah, when I picked up that whip the first time, I was just kind of like, yeah, this is the thing. And I want to be the 
best. Like, I don't want to be okay. I don't want to be good. Mm -hmm. I want to be the best. I want to be the one where it's like, oh, yeah, just get Patricia to do it. She's good. Not because, like, oh, get Patricia because we don't like, but, like, almost like, oh, that's, yeah, that's really f***ing. We'll have to call Patricia. She's the only one. <laughs> we need a serious pro. We need a serious pro. That's what we need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, so that's a good, that's, that'll take you far. That attitude will take you far. Last question, just because I'm curious. This one's for my curiosity. How, what does your family think about your sisters, your mom, your dad, about you now, you know, volunteering with women on site, helping being a peer mentor to other women, you know, you found this trade that you're doing great in and you thoroughly enjoy and every day is a smile and, and you want to be the best. And you, these are all positive awesome things you know what's this done for your family relationships and the dynamics there um, incredibly positive um um with my father unfortunately he's not in the picture anymore uh so and i think that he's the only person really i would have been worried that wasn't positive about uh what i'm doing now but my mother and my sisters and my extended family my partner everyone is like so proud of me and everyone was just thinking like it's so crazy that I'm doing what I'm doing um and that kind of helps too you know like it gets kind of like mm -hmm. crazy every time I like I meet I see a family member I haven't seen it forever they're like I see what you're doing that's so crazy like how are you doing it and it's kind of nice because it's you know I've always kind of been like so the it's, short it's ended empowering yeah. yeah the short ended one for a while so it's kind of nice to like kind of to be like how could you do it i could never do it and i'm like i know <laughs> you know because <laughs> it's true it does take a certain type of person especially in a shipyard it takes a certain type of person mm -hmm. to be able to survive that so yeah and i think that it's just like the tough times when i was a kid like created that person of survival and that person of and that person of people pleasing that probably helps me mm -hmm. also in my job and being able to whether it's stressful or a hard situation, being able to still be a positive, upbeat person, that's probably coming from people pleasing. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, it's almost like even the the terrible stuff has like helped me be who I am and like get me where I am. It always does. You yeah. never know the big picture. Push on through, right? There's always uh there's always new opportunities. That's the way I look. I don't I don't I don't even believe in the word failure. I think failure like the only the only way someone fails for me is if you don't try. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Right, like if you tried and it didn't work out, how is that a failure? You tried. Yeah, you like, learned something. Kudos. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> all right, Patty. Well, this has been a fantastic interview. I had so much fun. I hope. Uh, I hope you did too. I did. Thank you so much. This has been a therapy session, but it's also <laughs> been just so nice. To, like I don't know. I haven't really reminisced this hard, so it's been crazy. It's almost. It's nice. Because I think you never really think about how far you've come or how much you've done. Because we always just like keep you know, think about what it took to get there. So having to go back and like bring myself all the way back to the front, it's like, yeah, in like less than two years, all of this has happened, and that's crazy. So thank you. <laughs> that's amazing. Any shout outs you'd like to send to anybody? Oh, shout out. Um, obviously, women on site. Mm-hmm. That's it. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, Women Outside is fantastic. Like I said, they're a great organization that I, I love to help support as well. Um, check them out online. And, uh, well, Patricia, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much, Max. Have a good night. Uh, and for all the people that have been downloading, following, sharing, commenting on the posts and the podcast, thank you so much. Uh, keep sending your requests. We answer all questions. And if you got anybody out there that you think would be a great story or you wish to show off what you're doing, whether it's art or business or on the floor somewhere on a cool project, just reach out. We uh, we love you all. We love just sharing the stories and getting things out there. So stay tuned for the next episode and we'll see you there. We hope you enjoy the show. <laughs>